Welcome to the sixth and final episode of series five of Entangled Discussions, back with a big bang, quantum and space. For those new to the talks, we're a friendly, inclusive group and encourage interaction. Um, Natalie Hills, my colleague at Entangled Positions, is helping manage the audience input. So please use, use the chat box for any questions or observations along the way. Um, for those comfortable taking the mic, there will be an opportunity to join the conversation during the event. Um, these talks are recorded and go on to our Entangled Discussions YouTube channel and also share, shared on LinkedIn. Um, we are changing the way we administer these talks slightly, so um, please follow Entangled Positions on LinkedIn and Entangled Discussions on YouTube to ensure you stay up to date. Um, so during this theme, we've explored how the quantum revolution and new space race are inextricably linked and hold a strong influence in a multitude of arenas. Um, so today we're in the superposition of having um, all of this series guests, um, apart from Manuel and Tumba, who unfortunately can't make it today, um, return for a tru truly entangled discussion. So, so discussing the, the very smallest things we know of to the very largest, um, it's a pleasure to welcome back Malak Trebelsi loeb founder of Vernwell LLC, LLC um, Sonali Mahopatra, um, Space and Applications Lead at Craft Prospects, Daniel Oy, Senior Lecturer at Strathclyde University, and Rupesh, Rupesh Srivastava, um, President of One Quantum Argentina. So um, as each of our guests is able to um, offer really a, a fascinating vantage point, um, and they've each brought an observation for us to explore. So with this format, no one knows what the other topics are until they're revealed creating a spontaneous conversation with no safety nets. So this really is one small step for entangled discussions, one large, giant leap for imagination. So first of all, welcome to all the guests. Um, and without further ado, um, Malak, um, obviously you were the, 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 the last guest on, on the series. Um, if, if you'd like to, to kick us off. Hello, hello. And thank you for having me again uh, to the show. It was uh, quite interesting and I'm, I'm following up the, the videos with the other um, um, speakers and it's fascinating. Thank you for uh, paving the way and having these discussions in the, uh, 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 like uh, in, in times that we really need to hear about quantum and we need to speak about quantum. Of course, when I say I am the, non-technical person here. Uh, so I'm coming from the legal industry and uh, and um, I found myself in this uh, a beautiful community and I am helping, um, let's say, uh, in a way of, uh, of, of um, uh, compliance with the, with, the, with the rules and regulations and laws, uh, whether in the quantum uh, community or other technological community. And I would like to say, because we're speaking about space and, and quantum also is, is, uh, is, is the new race. And as I said, before and I keep um, uh, stressing the point is the new space race is the quantum race. So uh, I would I would I would say some uh, a quote by uh, Neil Armstrong, which is the quote I had it in my thesis, and I uh, uh, it's it's the opening quote for my um, master thesis, and also I I go by uh, this uh, quote uh, in everything I do, and I he said I think we're going to the moon because it is not the nature of the human being to face challenges. It's by the nature of his deep inner soul, we require to do these things just as a salmon swim upstream. And actually this is what we are doing. This is what 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 uh, uh, the, the quantum race about. It's uh, it's not about going to the moon only, but it's about opening a new dawn for uh, humanity to move forward. And what I say, it's the evolution for uh, humanity is going to be um, is going to be enabled by quantum technology. And I give you back the mic. Thank you, Malak. Um, so, so quite a fascinating um, opener there. Um, and Rupesh, if you'd like to, to start on that one. Well, Malak, that's a fantastic quote. So thank you for that. Um, you know, it reminds me of, of all that all those years ago. It seems like a like a much longer, it feels like a much longer time than it actually was. So back in 2016, when uh, when I joined the, the UK Quantum Computing Hub, and and they were seeking to engage uh, industry, 
in a technology that didn't exist and that might not and that was 10 years away and had been 10 years away for four decades. So it's really important, I think, um, to, to try. And if you have that mindset of, of giving it a go and not knowing where, you, um, where you're going to, to end up, I mean, I'd like to, to give a quote of my own, inspired by Malik, but uh, my, one of my favorite quotes is that uh, um, uh, a ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are built for. So you have to go exploring, you have to take the risk, you have, you have no idea what's gonna happen. But then humanity won't evolve, won't innovate. You won't get the great leaps that we've been seeing over, over the many hundreds of years now. And where could that take us? I think that's really, really exciting. And, and Malik is right, there is, there is this idea of a race, and, um, and, uh, but it's, you know, it's completely global, it's geopolitical, it's really, really complex. I've listened to one of Malik's talks just on, from the legal framework of accessing space and who can do what is, is just phenomenally complex. Back to you. <laughs> Sorry, my, I, I did forgot my mic was off. So th thank you, Rupesh. And, and Daniel, if we can bring um, you into to follow on on, on that observation. Yeah, no, I, I think that is. Um, I mean, the, um, your point in your question or uh, discussion point is very pertinent to um, myself as an academic, and that um, you know the reason why I originally got into this field of you know quantum information, quantum computation, was really from the uh, for the fundamental aspect about trying to understand the world and what uh, what we could learn about the world about, about studying quantum theory and quantum mechanics as being the most fundamental um, theory or, or description about reality. And the knowledge that um, if we take um, you know, quantum theory at its, you know, um, seriously and, and, um, and revolutionize the way that we think about information about computation with, with the... Um, you know, with the insights from quantum theory, you know, we've led to this revolution. So coming from the academic point of view, it's, it's great that what originally started off as a very academic um, pursuit about trying to understand the world through the lens of quantum theory and from information theory, we have this new revolution. Um, and then progressing from that, um, you know, the you know, the applications and the benefits that, that um, we hope to reap from that, from, the initial, from those initial insights are especially um, exciting to work on. And this is, you know, um, you know, from my career, you know, from, from starting from very fundamental um, starting point to you know, all the way to working with companies trying to commercialize this technology has, has been very exciting. And Sonali, if we can, if we can bring you in uh, at this point. Thanks very much. And I think it's a good segue from Daniel because I work quite closely with Daniel in my first year of when I kind of jumped into this industry and I was working as a IAA fellow with him at the University of Strathclyde, as well as Kraft on a joint contract. So it was kind of what Daniel mentioned that it was very exciting from jumping from my career as an academic where I was actually looking at more theoretical aspects of quantum um, and I, I was looking at you know I was excited about quantum gravity and all the quantum fundamental theory and then I came across and I saw that all that theory is actually being applied and the exciting part was kind of bridging the gap between the academia and engineering and then starting to build those uh, actual instruments that we are going to put on satellites. And then at the same time, I started understanding a bit more about the, all the different kinds of quantum technologies that we can onboard onto satellites. So we have worked like specifically, Daniel and myself, on quantum key distribution and also on quantum random number generators. But at the same time, I'm seeing hope when I see quantum because you know, I went to a talk where Cambridge City Council was talking about using quantum sensors to, mod, uh, you know, monitor air quality and water quality and looking at, you know, groundwater and quantum can be used wherever we want more information, more precise information or better information. And the fact that people are using it to steer forward humanity in a much better direction, starting from climate change to monitoring solar flares to, you know, protecting our encryption, all of that 
is what is keeping us going forward. And I'm a big believer, well, not believer, but I mean, I'm a big follower. I read a lot of complexity theory about how do humans evolve, right? And you see that we evolve very exponentially. It's not sustainable uh, with the amount of resources we have. But in order to keep ourselves sustainable, we do these big paradigm shifts that make us innovate faster and better and completely in a new, different way, which allows us to perform more efficiently within the limited resource constraints. And that's what I think quantum computing, as well as all the quantum information and the space race together is doing again, like quantum computers, quantum key distribution, all of that are a giant leap for mankind in order to make its way to the future. I mean, hopefully we are all gonna become like all those enlightened creatures in fantasy. That, that's my fa personal fantasy. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Sonali. Um, and I, I think actually the with, with the quote, one thing that was interesting, um, listening to um, sort of evolutionary biologists and the like, um, and that there's kind of two um, in, in evolution, you've kind of got the, the risk takers that may be more successful, but they're also more likely to be out of the gene pool. Um, but then you also have the ones who are who, who sort of take the safety first approach and maybe less likely to come out of the gene pool, but maybe less safe in evolutionary terms as well. And I think the the the, the kind of the the Armstrong quotes um, and the, the space race you need you need the, the sort of steady hands to support it, but you do need that that adventurous spirit to really push the boundaries and and, and take those those leaps of imagination as well. So um, thank you, Malak. Fantastic, uh, fantastic way to start and get everyone thinking. Um, You're welcome. Thank you. Actually, it was it was spontaneous as you want it. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do not even know I will start. So <laughs> <laughs> and, and no, no safety nets here. So perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and, and then um, Sonali, if you'd like to um, bring the next topic to the group. Ooh, okay, next topic to the group. Um, yeah, I guess the next topic, so because I specifically work on, I guess, like a combination of artificial intelligence, quantum and space, then the way I see industry and academia collaboration as being a you know, big key uh, driving forward for all the innovation that's happening in the sector, I think something that Scotland and the UK particularly uh, do really well is these knowledge transfer partnerships um, and the fellowships that bridge this gap between academia and industry and form all the handshakes. And then that leads to a lot of uh, uh, talent transfer and knowledge transfer. So, you know, for example, Daniel is one of the experts in the industry. And if I hadn't been working with him, then I wouldn't be getting all of that knowledge to transfer into craft, for example. And also the systems, you know, space systems knowledge of craft into the uh, into academia as well. So I think it's really important to learn from these and to uh, realize that all of these uh, bridge bridge or bridging career kind of jumping points is extremely important to developing this ecosystem collaboratively. Uh, it's not a who does it first. It's more about how do we compete in a healthy way to drive for, drive it forward together. Um, but again, then the, then the next part where it's international collaboration. So going forward, we will be forming, we will need to form big networks, big combinations of satellites, um, you know, big quantum networks all across the world because we are safe only when everyone's safe. We can't leave anyone behind. And um, so there you will see, as Rupesh was saying, I think it's very com complex. So there's the political front, obviously. There's export controls. Um, and how much, you know, what what part of a system can you actually export from one country to another? Then there's academic collaboration, which is very open, and there's a lot of papers being written on it. And there's, there's IP protection for different, different companies as well as uh, industries. And then how does funding goes into that again? So I guess open to the floor. We can all jump in and uh, add to it. Actually, I will. I will uh, allow me, John, to have a comment to uh, about about what uh, Sonali just mentioned. Because I was I, I was I was going to introduce you for that one, Malik. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Actually, open to collaboration, uh, and and this is this is what we uh, um, we talked about last uh, um, when I was I had a, a talk with uh, John uh, recently, and actually I stress the point is in academia also there is an issue when it comes to collaboration 
Putin with non-partners and allies when it comes to national interest. And this is the thing that I, I, uh, I raise awareness about, uh, because uh, especially when, when uh, the United States is uh, involved to any of or having as a, a, a party or academics, they are involved into uh, these kind of strategic uh, technologies, especially quantum, uh, uh, there is there is a due diligence needs to be done because uh, need to know if any center that it's uh, uh, acting uh, like or or working on uh, kind of these technologies, and there is uh, uh, a funding coming from a non-ally or or um, like let's say adversary that is not allowed by the United States, then there's long arm jur uh, 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 jurisdiction that is there, and it's like pulling that issue over there and stress on, on, on the point. And here, um, I, I, I remind also the audience what happened, uh, like in the beginning, I think, of the year, that a lot of people, they were called by the, Nash, by the, the competing authority in the United States to investigate about their collaboration regarding uh, some uh, uh, technologies and, and quantum was uh, involved. So it's very, very interesting and very, um, uh, very, uh, we need to be due, uh, due diligent, and that's why what I say is uh, th there is there is an intersection of issues that is going on because actually technology, and this is what I, I talked about last time when I had the presentation. Technology is a part of the national interest when it is touching, you know, the 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 the, the let's say the. the um, the economy, because the economy before wasn't a part of the, the national interest. Now, now the economy has become one, and because it's uh, it's uh, the technology is an enabler, so it's it's a part of it. Other than just uh, uh, export control, and this is what I was also mentioning before. Uh, there's there's a, a very important point when uh, um, the the. Uh, private sector and business uh, activities are taking place when there is any investment call and those investors are non, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, coming, the investments coming from any uh, link to non-allies and uh, non-partners of any country uh, that it is uh, 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 like not allowing uh, this kind of uh, uh, investment to flow in this uh, um, activity, it's a problem because there are other uh, long arm jurisdiction uh, uh, issues that they are involved and long arm uh, uh, laws that they are involved and and it's a big problem. Like like I said, there's Firma and CFIUS, they are uh, controlling, let's say the investments that they are uh, activities, they are injecting in uh, or related to activities that has uh, um, a proximity to United States. So th this is a, a, an issue that needs to be taken into consideration because it's uh, it's alarming. Thank you. Back to you, Sonali, if you want to. No, I think that was that was that was very interesting to hear. Obviously, like from your legal expertise, um, and I guess that's another another field that I failed to mention that it is very important to bring in legal expertise at this point because we do not understand like as engineers or scientists we don't understand all of those nitty gritties but that's that's where this ecosystem is very multi um i guess disciplinary um and then there's also legal nitty gritties in the space sector like what you can you know which orbit you want to put something in and how do you register those uh where do you do the launch from and i think uk is right now kind of like putting into place a lot of different kinds of launch regulation because it's, it's getting ready for uh, launch from its own soil. That's also exciting. Um, but at the same time, there's another part to this that we need standardization, right? Standardization of different laws, standardization also of different technical requirements and de technical specifications across all the devices and instruments we build. Um, and that would also require standardization of knowledge, uh, like what is seen as the security standard, for example, or what is seen as the standard for a particular quantum sensor to be used in medical imaging or not. Uh, there's a lot of, um, these are also sensitive areas, right? Because if you're using for example, quantum sensors for imaging the brain uh, in uh, in people who are autistic, and it can it can help them to uh, determine uh, different kinds of brain behavior before. But then you got to bring people who will be uh, benefiting from that into the discussion as well. And then there's a lot of medical legal literature around that. And so in the same in cryptography, because when we are saying that we are providing a quantum key distribution cryptographic service, we should be ready to be to understand also 
So all the legal uh, jargon around cryptography and how do we uh, integrate all of that into current cryptographic systems. We should understand data protection laws. We should understand to make sure that all of that is actually not just a box ticking exercise, but we have actual experts in the room who can, um, you know, who can give actual knowledge into developing a very robust system of the future, I guess. If um, maybe, yeah, maybe Daniel wants to jump in on this and talk about, you know, the standardization and interoperability on the QKD side of things. I know that that's something that, you know, we've all been thinking about quite a bit. Yeah, um, yeah, actually, the, this is quite topical because um, uh, it's something that um, is happening now. I mean, the, the standards committees are now having um, specific quantum um, working groups on this. Um, I'm, I'm part of the uh, British Standards Institute, um, you know, quantum working group on, on um, standardization. Um, and I'm, you know, working, um, you know, informally with international uh, partners, international missions to really try to lay down some interoperability um, uh, principles, really. Uh, we're still at quite an early stage of, of, of say, space quantum communication, where um, even, even in normal classical optical, uh, um, optical communications, just um, normal, um, you know, um, you know as, a, as a alternative to radio um, telecommunications, that is still at a relatively um, early stage of standardization for optical comms. So um, actually um, you know, to, um, you know, to standardize quantum communications in spaces is uh, you know, even further, further behind than that. But it's gonna be increasingly important as we try to build out these systems. And as Sonali has, has, has pointed out quite rightly, you know, we need to build these large systems, these constellations, um, you know, they, they really to, to build upon the scale and uh, make most effective use of the space environment, you know, they should work together. Uh, otherwise, we end up with these uh, separate disparate systems, um, you know, uh, the users, the end users, they suffer, um, you know, we don't, um, you know, we don't benefit from, from, from scale. So uh, standardization and interoperability um, you know, is very important, um, not just about interoperability, but also as, as uh, Sonali has also mentioned, um, you know, the cryptographic standard. So security itself is, um, there are a lot of, uh, I'll say snake oil sellers out there and um, security claims and security standards, um, you know, it's something that, that, you know, if you get it wrong, um, you know, it's very, very, um, can be very disastrous. So having strong standards um, so that, um, uh, you know, security is maintained, especially in an area when we're talking about, um, you know, um, QKD or, or quantum cryptography is still a very, very um, young area. So the expertise out there is, is much smaller than in classical cryptography. Um, you know, at the stage, there is that engagement process between, um, you know, quantum cryptography and, you know, the traditional classical um, cryptography community. And I think that's very important. So um, because we need to integrate quantum cryptography into the existing um, frameworks, existing um, cryptographic communication networks and, and, and their standards. So, um, so yeah, I, I, would, I would support, you know, the, this, um, you know, movement towards, you know, greater communication, greater, um, you know, interaction uh, between the various communities, because, um, you know, the nature of communication is that we do need thing, you know, all these things to talk to each other in a, in a secure and, um, and specified way. Very rightly said, Daniel, and I guess to kind of like, uh, going towards this, the next very important block I see, and I would direct this to Rupesh, is getting people of all different shapes and sizes and colors and races and genders into the pool that is actually creating all of those technologies. Because at the end of the day, we are building technologies as enablers for humanity, for everybody. And uh, if we have learned from our mistakes, then since this this particular sector is quite nascent, it's quite a good place to start to build a very inclusive and diverse community, which can then kind of feed into the kind of technologies and the architectures and the communications that then develop in the future. Rupesh, the floor is yours. Well, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, the nice thing about the, the quantum community is it's global. So you're meeting people from 
all kinds of different backgrounds, different places, different cultures, different ideas. And that's what makes it really exciting because you have to actually make the effort to reach out and communicate. And I'm talking about communicating on a human level. Right, and, uh, and, then, and then you're discussing ideas, you're creating value. And it's really quite exciting. Um, but then invariably you hit um, bottlenecks or, or storms, whatever, whatever metaphor you want to use, where, where um, you, you, you understand again um, that the world doesn't operate in, in a fair way or in an inclusive way. Uh, and what are we going to do about that? And, and it's really important, I think, um, uh, to stand up, um, to raise our voices, to actually show the world in a, what, a, what a different way can look like. Because the, for, for me, quantum, one of the things that um, uh, I'm trying to write an article about it and putting down these sort of complex thoughts into words is, 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 is quite difficult. But you know, uh, the quantum, the emerging quantum industry is, is very much a 21st century phenomenon. And for, and for me, that means that we uh, have to build for the future. And then you have a really great opportunity to, uh, to do something different, to be different. And so somebody has to, has to start. And then, as I always say to John, and and and, and you've probably heard this as well, and and uh, and I'm going to bore the bore the viewers again with this. If you really get to uh, some kind of um, grips with quantum physics, quantum mechanics, then you then you understand that these, as far as as far as our current understanding is, these are this is the basis of our of life of our universe, and we're in that, and it doesn't discriminate. It's operating in all of us as, as, as it's operating in our, the table that this, this, uh, my iPad is sitting on and so on, right? Uh, and, um, and so why should we? Why aren't we guided by, by what life is doing? I mean, we, you know, we try to copy and emulate things in nature for our technology. Uh, uh, but... Uh, but why can't we be guided on, on more fundamental principles of life itself? And I think, I think then we can, powerful. and then we can, I think, accelerate our innovation, our collaboration, because the challenges we face aren't just, uh, aren't just deciding. I mean, this is a trivial example. It's a British example, which way, uh, 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 which is, which way uh, a, a falling piece of toast lands, butter side down or butter side up. It's not a trivial thing. These are things that uh, affect everyone, like poverty, hunger, climate change, you know, extinction events, disease. You know, we're seeing the re-emergence you know, of new variants because guess what? Life carries on, regardless of what we think. So, um, you know, uh, you know, as my wife always says, you know, we are better together. But how do we balance all of that with all the geopolitical trends, the, the uh, quantum nationalism that's going on, the protectionism? And against a backdrop of, uh, you know, seemingly never ending wars, you know, you can just pick any day in any part of the world and people are fighting each other. So can we outgrow all of this, these tendencies? And we'll need to, to get into space, because space is hard, right? So quantum is hard and space is hard. So Absolutely. Over, over to you, John. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so, I guess, yeah, over to you, John. <laughs> so hard squared is, is like following Rapesh, really, isn't it? <laughs> um, but actually with... Um, with some of the comments mentioning about the how to connect kind of connect the, the the different stakeholders how to make sure there's there's paths for um 
people to disseminate information, so to mentor and learn, um, and even exchange information. Um, as with with my role as special advisor to the Quantum Strategy Institute, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I was asked to give comment on the the challenges around workforce issues, which I think that's perhaps a microcosm of the wider um, the wider quantum ecosystem um, and. The, the, the first sort of things that my, my mind focused on was, okay, so, you know, over the years, how have we gone about alleviating some of these challenges and um, not just creating the networks of people, but pathways through that. And, and then the, 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 the kind of the more holistic um, aspects to it really came to the fore in that, um, you know, things like education and training, how, how is that equitable? Um, how do we, how do we make sure that this, this, really um, enthusiastic global community um, is nurtured in the correct way. And that's, that's, you know, that that's not solely academia, it's not solely industry, it's not solely government, um, it's not solely the, the, the not for profits that are, um, that are working to this, it actually requires um, thought and insight from, from, you know, as many stakeholders as possible, and if possible, all stakeholders. Um, to make those those pathways um, as, as open as possible. It's almost like uh, looking at neurons, you know, the, the more well connected they are, um, the more effective they are. So it's about creating that ecosystem and, and really making the, the, the pathways as well trodden as possible so that that dissemination of information, um, the, the collaboration of talent um, and the equity of opportunity is allowed to flourish um, and, and bringing, uh, bringing everyone to the, to the table. Because as Roop said, you know, the, um, you know, quantum's hard and space is hard. So why are we trying to limit the, the intellectual input that we've, we have? So um, that, that's, that probably raises more questions than gives answers. But I think if, if you don't have the, um, the idea of what, where you want to get to, it's very difficult to create a, a route to get to that place. So first of all, it, you, you need to, to have the, the right desire and actually then um, look in detail and regularly bring to the table what, what that roadmap looks like and how that's best implemented. Um, and so, so, sorry, Malak, I, I, just, I just saw you, you motion there. Did you want to come back in before we move on to Daniel or? Yes, I, actually, sorry, but I wanted to say something. First of all, uh, back to Rupesh first, then I will say something about that, because actually for the first time, I'm going to share something uh, from an experience of one year right now about uh, uh, being in an ecosystem which is bringing space, quantum, artificial intelligence, uh, blockchains and everything. So the first thing is like, I will, I will, I will uh, comment to Rupesh about uh, uh, doing something for humanity and and uh, uh, getting these technology uh, uh, technologies to uh, let's say to not create a problem uh, uh, and 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 uh, make it a way of a new war because we have a new war now it's the economic war and it is also led by the techno technological war uh, what is the beauty about technology uh, is is uh, how technology can really solve issues that we are uh, for for not decades but, but for centuries uh, uh, witnessing as humanity and one of them i talked about is the use of satellite technologies to combat human trafficking and this is very very important because actually really uh, satellite technologies and there are reports done by the uh, competent authorities from the, the uh, from the united states and there are uh, other uh, organizations they working on that and actually in every countries uh, in every country around the world uh, uh, including yours right now each one of you there are uh, um, at this moment millions of children and adults are trapped in slavery and uh, uh, trapped in modern slavery at, uh, today. So actually satellite technology and it's proven and you have uh, um, done uh, uh, research about it. And I have one of the PowerPoint I, uh, uh, I, I posted on LinkedIn a long time ago and it shows how it is utilized. So the, the beauty of technology that it is our salvation in a way that it uh, eradicate poverty, it can uh, eradicate issues uh, and, and, and bring up human dignity to what it should be and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. So this is number one thing that, uh, thank you so much for mentioning that. 
And this is what we work around to, uh, uh, to get uh, our, uh, uh, let's say, um, even from my part, that I'm not a person that who is a technologist by, by profession, that I help to, 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 to uh, uh, bring what, what I know and my, my uh, passion into um, um, getting forward like you are, Rupesh and Sunali. I, I, I know very well that you are active into, in, in things that they are related to uh, gender equality and, and elevation of uh, people from uh, like uh, from different uh, countries into uh, uh, getting uh, forward and uh, to evolve. Um, um, but there is one more thing that I'm going to be open about it because you mentioned it, John. It's about how to build an ecosystem, how to bring people together. And actually, this is my uh, my my uh, uh, experience that I've been living for one year. One year ago, I, I founded Vernwell, and Vernwell was specific with a business model that it was in the beginning with certain, uh, 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 in the beginning with certain, let's say, um, services that are related to business advisory, because I've seen that people that are coming from or, or te technicians and uh, technologists uh, and, and, and uh, uh, let's say brilliant uh, brains coming from academia and they are in, uh, inventors, they have a problem to innovate because actually in, in uh, invention and innovations, they're not the same. So it's like uh, uh, it can be it can be a solution and it can be innovation to bring a solution into a business sector or specific specific you know, supply chain or something that you can commercial, uh, commercialize and, and, and solve this kind of issues. So it was a certain business model. Then, then I started with it and I said, it's not going to work because actually uh, uh, building a consortium of other uh, companies to have a certain kind of, uh, of, uh, of service is not going to work because I've seen there's a problem of trust it's not about me personally. It's about trust in the technology area. It's a problem of competition and it's a problem of non-disclosure and problem of uh, who wants to have the biggest piece of cake. So this is very, very important. So there's a set of like the, like the mindset need to be evolved. So I worked in stealth to see what are the exact issues within the technology arena in specific sectors and specific technologies in order to learn, because actually I'm not coming from, and it's nascent, uh, I mean, quantum technology is, is, is new, space, space uh, uh, um, related application and technology people, they are there, they are also, let's say I've, I've, I've met some people, they have uh, patents since 20 years and they want to commercialize. It's like, how is it possible since 20 years you want to commercialize today? I mean, uh, uh, I, I did not know it at that time when I met those people. I did not know that we had these kind of issues that we need to find solutions to these issues. How can you commercialize something that it is old, old technology, that it, you, technology is moving fast, very, very fast today, and the problems are, are moving further. So how can we do? So I, 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 I've, been, I've been like taken uh, a, a stance and seeing in the field in order to do this. And this is what I'm trying to build, an ecosystem of people with the same mindset in order to do that. Actually, I'm almost there because actually right now, I'm, I even I changed the business activities of Vernwell. So now from business uh, 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 from business advisory only, it's innovation, AI, research, and uh, 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 business management and advisory. So I, 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 I and, and there's a problem with regulations also. When we touch everything, the laws are changing very, very uh, fast that you find yourself actually investment advisory, it was included. I took it off now and I'm making another entity in order to do that because actually with, with the change also of legal, uh, uh, of, of, of the laws and regulations, we try to follow with what is going on in order not to fall outside of the uh, compliance issues. So this is the problem. There are a lot of issues that they are uh, involved other than just the human nature. So it's, and, and this is what we need to do. We need to make one voice in order also to, to, to voice up to the, to the uh, um, uh, lawmakers to make it easier for technologists to, to, to work and to commercialize, to have a better view, to have incentives and so on. So I, I, I wanted to, to share that and it's coming from the heart. 
As, 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 as always, Malak, I'd expect, I'd expect nothing else than it coming from the heart, but it, it, it's, it just gives that, that um, different, different dynamic to, or another layer, should I say, um, onto some of the, the topics as well. So um, I, I suspect we'll come back to a lot of these themes. Um, and Daniel, if we can bring your um, topic of conversation into play as well, please. Yeah, so I mean, um, I, I guess the general theme I wanted to, 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 to bring up was uh, really related to what's been discussed before, and that's really engagement and how do various um, you know, aspects or, or, or uh, sectors engage with each other. Um, on, a, on a more technological front, um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm working mainly in, in you know, um, space quantum networking, space quantum communications, and, and, and um, I see this as really as a, as a, a substrate or an enabling technology really to bring together other technologies, you know, such as quantum computers, quantum sensors, um, you know, timing synchronization, um, things like that. Um, and so um, it, se it seems to be a, a, a pretty um, good place or central um, uh, activity to really bring together all the various aspects of quantum technologies together, um, say, you know, say for, for space or you know, in general. Um, so um, in terms of how, how can the different um, areas or ecosystems or sub ecosystems within quantum technologies, um, within space quantum, quantum technologies, you know, how how can we foster um, greater engagement between these separate areas? Um, because at the moment, um, I think people are, are you know concentrating rightly so you know on their immediate uh, developments, um, but eventually, as we've seen, you know, through say the um, you know the internet today that um, a lot of the power of the individual technologies are magnified, um, uh, multiplied by networking, by uh, interaction, by the ability to really take these separate technologies and actually get them to work together. And, and I see that um, you know, quantum communication is one way of, of really um, establishing that, that um, advantage. So that's one, one thing. Um, at a more, um, you know, at another level, which is, you know, um, you know actually very, related to what Malik uh, was, was just speaking about is really this, this engagement between, um, you know, different, um, I guess, levels of, um, say, of, of, the, of the technology development uh, cycle. Um, and, you know, from my perspective, you know, um, what's the best way for, say, for instance, um, academia to really interact with, um, you know, the burgeoning quantum technology sector? And, and how do we navigate this, um, you know, this labyrinth of um, intellectual property, about, um, about uh, um, non-disclosure, about commercial confidence, um, but still respecting the, the academic uh, bedrock of openness and of, of free exchange of ideas. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, think, I think these two things are, are sort of inter interrelated in that, you know, how, how do we balance the um, the various um, issues of, of um, you know, recognizing there is this advantage to um, greater engagement and interaction, but at the same point, um, at the same, same, same time, um, the, the, the need to protect one's own in interests. And if we can start with Sonali, if we can start with you on this one. Yeah, I guess like the, I think we are, you know, since we work together quite a bit, I think these are also problems that we are, I guess, aware of the same kind of ecosystem. And uh, from like from there's there's primes, bigger companies, then there's medium sized companies, then there's smaller companies, then there's academia, and each of them have their own, I guess, different kinds of contracts and IP protections and laws around them. And from an academic perspective, I guess you know you, academia is driven by the um, by the main uh, theme of producing, or I guess like ha being a fount of information and knowledge to the whole world, which is accessible to everyone, and that is the fundamental of it. And then we have multiple different kinds of NDAs that come into place. Like if you're working with a smaller company, then you have just an NDA that you start off with a standard template, and then. 
uh, when you go up to like a more bigger company, then an NDA doesn't really mean anything. Like there is multiple different, you know, um, contracts you have to sign. There's multiple different get get you know go aheads that you have to get. And then when you then interact with the government, then there's more laws that come come into place, which both academics and I guess uh, companies have to uh, play by. And I mean, I shared the same concerns uh, as both Malak and Daniel have pointed out about engagements and being free with knowledge. Uh, and I think we need to at some point go beyond a capitalistic mindset. Um, you know, even if I'm from a company, like I think there's a much better way of working together and, you know, uh, so that we don't we don't compete so much against each other, but kind of like work with each other to go up, go, go forward together. But I do not know what that model is right now. And I think this is this is where we need to also focus all, the, all those big minds into and come up with some sort of sustainable models. And there's there has been lots of people in history who have tried to come up with something that works. I think with the amount of information and amount of technology we have now at our disposal, we can actually start using technology to find solutions to some of our concerns because, you know, technology is an enabler. We can use AI to play around with different kinds of value systems and metric systems and figure out what actually works best as a as an equal reward system to everyone, you know. And again, we have to also ensure that some the person who's building those AIs has inputs and data sets from all over the world because otherwise we are miss we will miss out a big chunk of people and we will train our models on only a certain biased population so these are complicated problems and i guess i come from a mindset of let's use technology to solve many of them but also let's use uh let's kind of bridge the gap between social scientists as well as technological developments you know because that is again another artificial divide um, and we are coming to the point where we are seeing that it's a very people-based movement, along with being along with being about technology. It's a lot, lot of lot to do about laws around people, laws around interaction, and we need to bring in social scientists and you know people who understand interaction and you know human interaction, but in various different scales, much better. And they can also range from being physicists who look at like how humans interact, which are similar to electrons interacting, to social scientists who and economists again. So I think this is a complicated problem, but I think starting to talk about it is definitely, you know, um, and starting to talk about it in good faith with each other is definitely a very good way forward. And we can only go onward from here. But yeah, if if anyone else has more like more uh, concrete stuff to say on this, I you know I would love to hear as well. Um, and, and Malak, I think that's uh, a good cue for you to come in and, and join the discussion. Actually, I will let Rupesh because uh, yeah. I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> Rup Rupesh, Rupesh, please. Well, first of all, I want to re-echo what, what Sonali said. I think having, um, you know, uh, STEM and shape both need to be engaged, both need to be brought together because this is very much a people's you know, what is technology for? What are universities for? Why are we working? Why are we innovating? I think we need to, um, you know, I think about these things because we have too many silos and, um, and, 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 and problems accrue as a result. So, so for instance, so here in Argentina, one of the first communities I engaged with were English teachers. So, so uh, it, in parallel to discovering what quantum activities are happening in Argentina and try and bring the country together, um, I realized very quickly, if you want to engage with the, with the world, you have to speak in English. That's the language we all use for quantum, like we're using today. And, um, and then you discover the problems of the English language training is, is patchy. Uh, people don't have access to opportunities. Believe it or not, people are learning from YouTube and watching movies more than from schools and universities. And but when you engage with quantum, there's a whole terminology behind it, there's a whole history behind it, there's a whole uh, new way of thinking. You're addressing cultures, you're going across cultures. And so these communication things become paramount. So, so uh, formed a core team here in Mendoza at the university here uh, with, uh, with three English uh, um, 
uh, lecturers, uh, all women, and um, because they volunteered, it wasn't uh, targeted. And, and the team is called, uh, it's Team Etiquette. So it's innovate, the purpose is to innovate English language teaching by introducing quantum. Part of the science itself, but, part of, but as well as the impact of the science and technology. So how will it change the world? What, what are the pros and cons? It's getting people to write articles, you know, write essays, present uh, their ideas, present their research and their findings, their readings, you know, to the class in a, within a time box. So they can practice their articulation to a, to a tight deadline. So this will, you know, hopefully boost self-confidence. And when they are able then to reach out to other people in other countries, they can do so confidently. And therefore, expanding their opportunities. So that, you know, there's more than just a technological implication or a scientific implication. And I think that's really, um, you know, when you start talking about these things and start looking at these things, then you are uh, starting to see how we function as a society, how things work and don't work. But I think when looking at things, it is time for change. And, um, and we're seeing that through, uh, you know, through mental health, through the pandemic, through, the, through what has been termed the great resignation uh, in, in countries around the world. Uh, and, uh, people are looking for something different. How, you know, be, how they're treated is becoming far more important. And when you see these cultural shifts, you know, even in the quantum sphere, you know, especially in the UK, you know, I noticed a change and, uh, in, in how some academics start, start talking. You have, you have uh, uh, this culture of openness and that culture is closing. And, um, and, and those that are uh, spinning out companies, those that are uh, patenting, those that are getting more au fait with uh, the entrepreneurial um, um, stream, they st they, they, their language has changed. So they, so they started what I jokingly called uh, investorish. So they're saying things that, are, that would please an investor, but they were saying that to everybody, not just investors. You see, there, there was no discrimination in the language being used. And, um, and, and so, so suddenly getting to the truth, getting to where the technology is really at, where the science is really at, uh, it has become problematic. And, and as people have start to safeguard their research, uh, one is uh, safeguarding in terms of IP protection. Don't talk about that until it's patented or, you know, so on. Uh, to, uh, to being fearful of talking about it because there might be, there might be IP there. And if they release it into the public domain by talking about it, they've, they've scuppered their chances. So we need a completely different way of working and more trust between the two parties that historically don't trust each other. I'm talking about academics and industry. And so more of a collaborative, more of a, a community, more of an understanding, supported by, supported by a new framework, which is a legal framework too. So that is very clear uh, where the rights belong to. It's very clear how they can be exploited and so on. Back to you, John. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Refresh. Um, and I, I think as well, you know, there's, it's a really nuanced conversation because you know how academia interacts with other areas of academia or industry um you know even how um physics interacts with chemistry that and how that reacts with um the the, the, the sort of the, the heart and the soul or passion of people as well um the, it seems that it's it's a, it's something that that in many ways has to be broken down into smaller constituent parts but the one thing that that seems to override or that, that seems to um, join these things is is the communication aspect um, you know if you take the, the sort of serendipity of science how many great breakthroughs have come you know because a, a biologist had a coffee at the same time as a physicist and 
that the, they got talking about things and um you know that that sort of um interaction um you know whether it's on the the, the scientific the business um or, or interaction between other areas you know um, sort of um the the, the um, ethics and business and um, innovation, uh, along with talent, as those things interact, you know, that, that's where the real magic happens. Um, and a big part of it is, is actually how do you implement the systems or frameworks, as, as Rupesh just mentioned, um, to encourage that. Um, and I think you're always going to have some people that are more open, gregarious, or, or um, willing to talk about what they're doing, other people that are going to be more closed. But having a platform or a system of platforms that provides the opportunity to interact maximizes the chances to be able to do that so that's something that um i think we have to work hard on and please please repesh yeah well i think one of the key things in engagement uh having worked in engagement for over five years in the uk um is is you have to be a bridge builder and you have to be you have to care about it and being a bridge builder um, is actually quite a complicated thing because being a bridge builder to government is different to being, say, a bridge builder to the space sector. You have to know, you have to know a bit on either side. And you might not be an expert on either, on either side, but you have to know enough. And you have to then be able to articulate and communicate and then bring these parties together because they're speaking different languages. And so you're the interpreter, you're the translator. And so there, and then when you when you're talking about that, it's quite a responsible position to be in. Then it's a position of integrity. Then values matter, so that you don't, um, um, you know, you don't uh, let down either side. You don't misrepresent either side. You don't overhype it. You don't misrepresent it. You don't lie. You don't, you know, and and it's in that. It's it's a kind of a. Um, you can't be selfish. So you have to put other things ahead of you. And that's and that's a, a really important aspect as well, John. And, and, and Malak, before we move on to the, the final point, as kind of the archetypal bridge builder spanning lots of different areas, is, is, is there anything you'd like to, to bookend this point I was, on? I was going to, to, to ask to speak. Actually, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm in different sectors and, and not sector, different, let's say, ecosystems. And this, I, I learned this when uh, my first year of international law. Actually, coming from uh, a bachelor and uh, of uh, law and economics, um, and at the same time, I practice in, in a law firm. Uh, and I was working, I was managing a law firm at that time. So uh, coming to the first year of international law, my first six months was a roller coaster for me. It was very difficult for me because actually when you have your brain contained, I'm talking to myself, about myself, I had my brain contained in one legal system with a little bit of patches of international law, but it's not really into uh, uh, the idea of uh, international relations, diplomacies, and things like that. Uh, diplomacy, uh, um, the area of uh, diplomacy. And, and of course, when I say diplomacy, there is the, uh, the, the, the state's actors, they are uh, acting in, uh, or they are into diplomacy, but also uh, like Rupesh, what he was talking about and building communities and building uh, different, uh, let's say, um, uh, cross, what we call it in international law, cross, fertilization of different cultures. It's very difficult. And, and like, like I say, my first, uh, let's say, uh, 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 you know, when you take someone and you shake him this way, it's like, wake up. That happened to me in my first six months of international laws, because actually uh, uh, the first um, master was international, uh, uh, public international law, which is the law governing uh, 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 public bodies, uh, states and, uh, and uh, others that they are uh, uh, governed by international uh, public law. And second year was international business law. So I did not have a choice 
but also knowing business activities. Actually, when you are making a contract and this contract is about commercial activity and, and this commercial activity, whether it's, it's a, 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 um, a contract of, uh, of uh, oil and gas or the other one is a contract of transportation or selling uh, 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 you know, um, uh, masks, Everyone started wanting to sell masks uh, at, at the dawn of, of, of this pandemic. So the, the thing is like uh, um, in all these kind of aspects, we need to know the business activities. And, and one of the things that I say to, to, to the, the, the clients or to people that they are uh, uh, asking me about a contract, listen, the trick is in the details and not the details of the law and the details of the contractual uh, clauses. It's the details of the, what is surrounding your operation. Here, the problems happen. Here, the issues happen. So uh, uh, and of course, it happened around, around the, 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 the interpretation, around so many things, even the choice of jurisdiction. But I'm, I'm taking you to something a little bit like uh, about my, my, my practice. And this is how uh, other than being in business before the, the, the law practice, this is how I started understanding ecosystems and understanding, let's say, I need to understand also the IP rights, uh, uh, like the, 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 the implication of the technologies to IP rights, what could happen, the risk management and things like that. So from there, it's like, I can tell you, for example, a transportation uh, coming from uh, China going toward, let's say, uh, uh, um, UAE and uh, having uh, uh, particular uh, issues related to storage, to this and that. Now I tell, I tell you, based on the on, on the goods that it is transported, I would tell you the the the, the whole situation in business wise. So this is the thing is like why uh, uh, I, I am uh, when you are practicing international uh, business law, even transactions, banking, uh, all these kind of payments, all these kind of things you need to be aware. So you put me either in, in quantum ecosystem, I would I would. Um, I would I would draft you a contract based on the situation and and the same thing when it's about space activities, but also with the space I needed to know the international space law in order to know what is the situation about these kind of things. So now there's one thing about the, the jargon and, and the, the understanding of uh, of let's say uh, uh, terminology and understanding the language of each uh, uh, you know uh, um, person coming from different ecosystem and trying to be there and to try to translate to the others that they're not familiar with it's it's difficult in the beginning but after sometimes you can be uh, aware about that so uh, I remember one of my professor and here now I'm going to Daniel when he spoke about academia and uh, uh, between academia and and business uh, uh, activity. It's important because I remember one of my professor uh, told me, you would have a problem. I told him, what is it? He told me, you are uh, a practitioner and in academia, you would have a problem because actually you will think like a practitioner. So this one hit me so hard. And that's why I'm, I'm, I try always to uh, understand and translate from one to other and use it as a leverage, as, as let's say added value and not something that's bringing me down. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Malak. Um, and obviously, we, 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 um, if we can, if we can bring um, your point or observation in, Rupesh, um, and, and we'll open that out to the panel, and and um, and then, then then bring the audience in after the the last observation. Okay. So. Um... As we've been talking about Neil Armstrong and ships and other things and, and QKD in space, what I would like to ask the panel uh, very, very quickly and very simply is there seems to be, uh, at least the media think so, but there seems to be a quantum space race, especially between the giants of US and China. Is that an uncomfortable, for everybody else, is that an uncomfortable sandwich to be in? And what could we do about that? Yeah, I'll jump in to say that I just hate that sentence, you know, the quantum space race, and I know you have to say it to accept it, but I just don't like the word the race, like 
what is that race about? Sure, you know, it's great to be building new and new technologies, but it, somehow it brings in that cutthroat competitiveness, which people seem to use in very glorifying terms, which never made sense to me, to be honest. And yes, to answer your question, very uncomfortable. But I think, you know, in, in my own little way, just having those, I guess I'm also, an, also do a lot of engagement like yourselves. And that's where the bridge building comes into play, you know, and you're all, I'm always on a personal level, always trying to foster more collaborations, more collaborations, more collaborations. Um, but hopefully learning enough on the on this ladder, or I don't know what to call it, but you know, in this whole network of many different people that I'm engaging with, to make some kind of change at, at some kind of vert vertex in this whole network. But also, I think like, um, pers on a personal level, I like I've started to write quite a bit um, and just like bring together these perspectives and to raise those perspectives that it does not have to be a race and why not and how can we actually go forward together. Um, you know, that, that I think is something concrete uh, which will be there for people to uh, engage with and take away and it's not, you know, like like spoken word, it's not going to go away um, and it, an article will be there as a point of um, Point of discussion and I think that's a starting point for me but also I'm learning a bit more about the side of legalities and all those all those um the quagmire of um IP and everything and I'm, I'm hoping that all of that will give me more perspective thank you Sonali and then I think there's a there's a logical segue here um with international relations IP contract uh, Malak if you if you'd like to, to give us your insights into Roop's observation as well please sure and actually uh I'm I'm I'm, I'm sorry Sonali and uh because actually it's a race and and this is we we don't like it but it's a race and I remember um and actually before before I I say a quote that uh, um, talking about the space race actually uh, uh I've been I've been called by NATO uh, in Italy uh, in the South uh, Hub, uh, which uh, called some um, ex ex uh, subject matter experts uh, related to uh, space uh, space race, and uh, in the MENA region. And actually, uh, my my presentation to them was about uh, the space race. Uh, and and uh, and and the issues that it is uh, related to the geopolitical problems that it's faced based on my practice and based I'm um, I'm not actually I'm not in the sandwich I'm the person who's trying to sort out the sandwich taking off you know the ingredients from the sandwich in order to have more clarity so the, the problem is like I uh, and and this is what I presented last time I told you John and to the audience uh, a part of my presentation that I shared with you uh, was coming from the presentation I uh, I I, uh, I delivered for NATO and uh, and it's very very interesting because actually some they don't see what is going on in practice. They don't know what is going on. And this is the risk assessment, the risk management, and the issues that we try. Uh, I, I, I uh, help uh, you know, investors especially to look into before investing and also the, 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 the companies that they are receiving the investments. It's important uh, for the risk management that is related to the national interest and the risk management that is related to the different laws that they can be applicable to the situation they have. So uh, we are in, in, a, in, 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 in times that the race is going to be even going further. And the problem is like what I try to, and this is one of the things that I, I presented to them is how can we move from this kind of race into collaboration, into all countries are collaborating. The issue that that when we are uh, talking about certain points that related to the to to international laws, some of the players they're not playing by the rules. And when you are not playing by the rules, you get uh, adversaries that they are not happy about your way of acting into that domain. And this is, I, I remind the audience what happened recently with the Russian, uh, uh, um, like the, 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 the like. things that they made and, and uh, uh, the, 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 the scandal happening in terms of space debris. So 
the issue that you have countries, they, they try to abide by the laws and other, they don't want to abide by the law. So when you are an, an outcast that you try to work on your own and do your own, make your own rules, even though you sign international treaties to, 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 uh, and, and you're not, you're not going by uh, those uh, uh, terms that they are in the international treaties, you are someone who is outside of the race. So out of the race that it is bringing people together with the same mindset of countries together with the same mindset so here we talk about adversaries we talked about about national interests we're talking about uh, issues that who is paying the 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 the, the, the let's say um, uh, expensive um, let's say uh, given away opportunities are all those startups that they are uh, trying to have uh, funding opportunities but those funding opportunities can be coming from an, a, a country or from an investor in a country or belongs to a country that it is it is uh, let's say having bad terms with his home uh, uh, country so uh, or home state here comes a problem which is ne needed in in the international level and diplomatic, uh, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, level need to be sorted out. So now there is one point is, for example, United States have uh, has its Artemis program and sign an agreement with uh, uh, allies and partners in order to uh, bring together all those uh, people from academia and others in order to collaborate uh, and uh, in, in these kind of projects. And this is also what I try to raise awareness about it is uh, there are opportunities, there are fundings, but be careful and know who you choose and where to act and how you act because all this will have implication for your uh, uh, business or uh, universities academia. And here also I say, sometimes universities also and, and centers within universities fall in the problem even though they have their legal team so uh, uh, this is what what I, I i i practice in a way in order to uh, uh and and i'm i'm so sorry sonali we are in a race and no no I yeah but i think that's really important as well i think what you mentioned there and i wanted to add one more thing that the word race actually makes it more visible that the problematic thing, the problematic mindset that's there. And it's not just in the international treaties right now. It kind of stems back to colonialism. It stems back to the man, you know, division of wealth. It stems back to the division of privilege across the world. And so the word race kind of implies that some people are racing while others do not even have the uh, while others access to that race has been taken away, for example. And that is a race. It it widens the inequality that already exists, you know, and we have to go beyond that. But yeah, we just have to figure out a way how to do that. And I think everyone, and you're playing a very important part and like, you know, in order to start those conversations and exactly in the legal terms, like this is what you need to be careful of. There is one more thing that it's very important is, okay, forget about the legal terms and the legal and international laws and things like that. There's something is called sustainable development. Sustainable development, which is wrongly perceived by, by the public. Sustainable development is about uh, 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 balancing the competing interest in each situation that we have in front of us and the interest is within different dimension you have the uh, economic dimension the social social dimension and you have uh, the other one is the environmental dimension of course some other uh, uh, like uh, uh, in academia added or, or under uh, you know uh, united nation or species they added for example cultural uh, dimension or uh, institutional dimension but but Still, all of them, they are there uh, working on a way if we apply at each situation these kind of indicators based on how we can balance the interest based on each uh, case by case basis is going to be very, very, uh, let's say, uh, move, we will move forward in every situation we are in. And this is also, it's very important. It's bringing back the sustainable development into the picture as is it a tool to balance the interests, the competing interests, and it's not tool used by states to undermine businesses or uh, uh, to, as a control, which is uh, uh, wrongly perceived by the public or maybe is mis- uh, um, let's say it's misused by some countries. Um, 
And Daniel, if we can, if we can now bring bring you in to um, follow on to these these points. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I I think we are in a in a, in a space race. Um, I think we've been kicked off really by the pioneering um, achievements by you know China and, and their Missius satellite, um, and we've seen you know a massive increase in the um, activity. And I wouldn't say it was just, you know, China or, or the United States. I think, um, you know, Europe, um, European Commission has been very uh, active in, in developing, you know, Europe's response to, to what's happening um, elsewhere. And I think it's unfortunate that, you know, the UK is, is now outside of that. Um, and it's certainly very difficult for, um, you know, the UK to participate in uh, these activities um, you know, um, particularly, you know, the Euro, Euro QCI, the European Quantum Communication Infrastructure and the space segment as part of that. So, um, you know, we're still having, we still have, um, you know, teething uh, issues with, um, you know, continuing engagement, um, you know, with Europe in terms of, our, you know, the UK research community and how we're going to go forward as part of Horizon, um, um, her, um, Horizon Europe, uh, as you know, as as the, as the ongoing um, flagship um, research activities within Europe, um, quantum technologies, you know, has been ring fenced as a strategic um, aspect of that research, and that means that um, any country outside of the core European bloc. Uh, is excluded from from certain activities. I mean, even countries such as Switzerland are not allowed, um, you know, uh, to to partake in, in certain core activities in quantum technologies, and and um, and space is certainly one of those areas where it's going to be increasingly difficult for, um, say, for the UK to um, to engage at the higher TRL levels. Um, thankfully, you know, there is still provision for. Um, engagement at the academic level and at the very low TRL level. So they, at least there is, they recognize that um, free exchange of ideas at those levels um, is important for the overall development of the field and that um, um, they're really restricting the, um, you know, the application um, of, of, um, of the technologies. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, I think um, it's a double-edged sword, right? It's, it's really good that um, there is this impetus, this, this um, global interest in developing these technologies for space. But at the same, uh, by the same token, um, we do see, see unfortunately, the, um, you know, the, the effects of competition and of um, you know, uh, um, you know, national or, or, or individual interests um, coming into play. Um, and I, I mean, as an academic, you know, I, I hope I can you know, play a, a role in Trying to break down some of those barriers and then try to work at the on the academic level to um, you know promote the free exchange of, of ideas and and really develop the the area for 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 the whole benefit of mankind. Yeah, it's certainly a, a highly nuanced area, and um, it's going to need a lot of thought and work to to go into that. Um, and Actually, well, during the talk, I've noticed that the um, the chat's been um, firing along, and I'm glad that I've got Natalie here to to help us today. So, uh, Natalie, if you if you'd like to come in and and help moderate from the the audience side of things. Yeah. So, um, I actually just sent a message to John and said if I start putting my my thoughts into this, we're, we're going to be adding another half an hour on, on top of it all because I, I just. Uh, this has been a great discussion um, and I'm really grateful as somebody that has um, no background in, in, in physics um, to actually have this insight into this side of the world because I don't actually feel like it's just the uh, gap that needs to be bridged between academia and industry. It's about also then bridging the gap between this and the public. Um, and yeah, I just just agree with everything really that 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 has been said. So I'll I'll leave it there because otherwise I will just I'll really take the floor with this one. <laughs> I've been hitting those keys, agreeing with everything everyone's been saying. So um, I just want to do um, acknowledge actually Bill 
um, added a couple of great links into the chat, which I've taken out. I don't know if the, the if anyone um, if anyone copies the links that come out of the chat, um, but uh, Bill was saying that um, aside from what uh, the NIST is working on in the post quantum cryptography world, they're also asking for comments on new technology, and he popped a link in there for the Federal Register. Um, as well, so you might want to check that out. Um, also, um, he was just uh, he pop popped in the link there for qworld.net, just saying that, that there's a lot of countries that are represented and genders as well, and he's happy to see the number of women who are becoming experts in quantum computing, um, considering the STEM uh, community was quite biased towards men, which um, you know is always refreshing because really this is about bridging. Uh, it, it, it's not even just academia and industry and then and then that and the the public it's about masculine feminine it's yin yang it's about we need to bring everything together and what I was saying in the comments about we almost need to bring everything back to zero and start again what I mean by that is we've got to bring in this more collaborative um, leadership uh, to be able to push forward and not be so disjointed um, something that came to me actually I will just say is that what what the key thing that feels to be missing is trust and how do we create trust we're vulnerable um, so it's almost like it needs to be a lot more of these kind of conversations and the vulnerability come into the surface so people can really see you know this this is a this is about people and not just not just profit um, so Avinash, I think that you're still with us, but he had loads of questions actually that he fired over to me about um, related to quantum internet, quantum and AI, quantum machine learning. So um, I will pass you over to Avinash and um, you can take the mic. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's a very great discussion and a uh, lot of questions are, uh, are got answered and uh, also, yeah, I really wondered, I never thought that there would be these many legal issues as Malak uh, specified. I uh, am a PhD student, so yeah, uh, I I don't know uh, that level of uh, things. And uh, so, uh, yeah, my only worry is that uh, way back when I started uh, doing research on quantum computing, quantum machine learning in 2019, uh, I found very few uh, sources, and uh, now there are. Uh, now I'm even uh, unable to cope up with the technology advancements that are being made. And but I still uh, feel that there is a, a gap between even between academia and academia. Uh, say the universities in some countries are uh, having a lot of resources and uh, doing very great research, and uh, in some countries. Uh, people are still struggling for the resources and all. So uh, my questions are related to uh, what uh, uh, what can we uh, propose or how can we collaborate such that uh, in the areas of quantum internet, quantum and AI, quantum and machine learning, so that we can propose some projects for right, uh, real-time high impact applications and what are the immediate applications that can make difference uh, uh, in a particular uh, country or uh, region and what are the different funding agencies around the world and how to collaborate with research groups to share knowledge and compensate the knowledge uh, so yeah I hope you understand uh, I have a lot of questions in my mind but yeah this is the uh, essence I want to say so I, I need some good direction and good path, the way we can collaborate with other industries or students and uh, research groups and all. So yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you. Yeah, and I think if, if um, as, as the audience come in, we can, we can make it an open panel and um, if any of the guests wants to sort of take the lead, they can. Um, I think to kick us off, maybe this is this is your remit, Daniel. Um, but other than that, if we, we, we can leave it as an open panel, you know, please all, all the guests feel free to, to join in. Yeah, um, I mean, I think in general, the academic community is, you know, quite open and definitely interested in exploring new ideas. Um, we, we see that, you know, the most exciting ideas do come from the cross-pollinization 
pollination of, of different areas and fields and stuff like that. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not an expert at all in, in things like machine learning or artificial intelligence, but, um, you know, it's some, definitely an area that, that um, you know, I want to, um, you know, interact more with. And, you know, there are, you know, even within my own university, you know, I'm, I'm interacting and engaging with um, people in signal in image processing who, you know, who are experts in, in machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. And, you know, we're developing um, ideas and projects um, to really try to, um, you know, combine the skills uh, of both, um, you know, both of our expertise together. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's really about, um, you know, engaging with us as, as different um, uh, areas and people, you know, people of, of different backgrounds, uh, different skill sets, um, even start local, you know, start local in your own institution, um, and often you know, you'll, be, you'll be able to, to, to spark ideas that way. Um, internationally, you know, I think, I think um, you know, some of the best ways of, of really engaging with, with the community is, you know, is to um, you know, um, you know, publish, is to, is to um, you know, have contacts on, on the various networks, such as you know, LinkedIn, of course, um, and, and really start those conversations. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I, I know my, myself, I'm, I'm very open to, to, to uh, starting those conversations with, with, with other people and, and really engaging um, and, and exploring new ideas where um, you never know where it's going to lead. Um, and, and, you know, it's, um, don't, don't, you know, don't be shy. And um, but it's also good to try to get a good idea of, of what you're trying to achieve. What, is, what are the core ideas that you think might be interesting? Um, you know, come up, uh, try to define the problems or the challenges that, that, that you see. Um, try, if you give them, um, if you define them well, then others can, can potentially engage with that um, uh, much more easily. So, you know, um, start, start local and, um, you know, try to um, engage as widely as you can. Thank you, Professor. Uh, yeah, that's a really great idea. I can do that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Nat, oh, sorry, Roops, did you want to? Yeah, yeah. So, just, so Abhinash, you're in India. You're based in India. Yes, sir. I, I'm I'm from India. Okay, great. So 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 I, I take Daniel's point that you can you know start locally, but you also have one quantum India there, uh, and I think there's Q World India as yes, well. So you can you, yeah, I, I subscribe these. to that. Yeah, I subscribe. Yeah, to so that yeah, but you can point. you can also be proactive with one quantum India and say we want to do a project, say a quantum computing project on X Y Z. Okay. And um, and 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 one quantum India will help you make that happen. Sure, sure. Thank you. Okay. I guess just to like quickly jump in here, I think it's it's impossible to do a lot of things and have your you know finger on the pulse on everything when you're doing your PhD, Avinash. Like that's yeah. not possible. And um, so I would try not to do that because then you're going to burn out. If you're trying to do too much i think your main phd like if you have a focus your thesis that is your main focus during your phd and then it's good to like keep keep up reading articles and review review papers are a good way of keeping up with what's out there but maybe not like you know uh, specialized papers from other uh other fields of expertise that are not yours because that would time that would require time and energy and that would take your time and energy away from your main thesis and at the same time what daniel said like conversations and contacts, like if you write to most academics, they get back to you um, with something. It might be a no that I do not have a project in my lab, uh, but it might be that, oh, I, I have something to help you with your CV, you know, or I can connect you with this person. And as Rupesh said, then one quantum networks and QL networks are good for making those contacts. But maybe like by the end of your PhD, you need to kind of have an idea of what you want to be working on uh, on the next step of your journey. And once you have that pinpointed, uh, you probably need to go and look up the papers of multiple different people who are working in that particular field, then find out what you don't like, discard them. 
if there are things that you like, go through the papers, contact them, have a discovery call like conversation with them to understand their research a bit better. And then um, I guess uh, make make a spreadsheet of all the open calls that are there. And uh, sometimes when you talk to professors, you can ask if there's funding available in their labs that might not be you know, out there in the websites of the universities uh, and they know about that they can nominate you for. Um, so I think those are some very like, you know, practical steps you can take. But I would I would say very clearly that do not try to keep up with everything because that will <laughs> take all your energy out. That's yes, not possible. Yes. I laughed. Yeah, Actually, I laughed, thank you. Mani, when you said <laughs> yeah. when you do your PhD, do not try to engage because otherwise you will be burned out. Actually, you yes, have yeah. burned out. Actually, yeah. this is what I yeah, Actually, I my mainstream work is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my mainstream work is on quantum machine learning. Uh, so, yeah, quantum machine learning and quantum AI are the fields of interest. And we also work a few projects on quantum internet. Uh, so that yeah, way so I yeah, also... apply to postdocs in those fields if you're interested. If you're applying for jobs, then remember that you will always start learning on the job. And again, the same thing for postdocs. Like if you're doing a project, you will start learning new techniques while you're researching in it. You can never know everything before you start a position. Nobody, nobody actually does. It's a great advice, uh, Sonali. Yes, Actually, yes. I'm, Those I'm are making very my very valuable suggestions. Yeah, thank you. I'm making my PhD at the same time. I have, I have, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I have, a, woman. I have a husband, <laughs> and I do all these kind of things. And my my time of sleep is maybe three hours every, sometimes three days. No, no. Malak, sleep. Sleep is important. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> but I, I, I find out like eight that. hours of sleep. I need ten. Oh my God, you're so you're so lucky. I can't because I oh, my mind works twenty four hours. So that's why I want to have a chip. Uh, what what what's his name? Elon Musk ch chip to help a little oh bit. Oh my God! So like that, I add some gigabytes. <laughs> well, yeah, I do. I do dream of the time when I can just upload a new language or a new subject in my brain. But you know, we have quite a quite a few few years to go before that can be possible and I don't get like a you know virus in my brain but yeah next question I guess <laughs> amazing and then um Eric Christoph you had a question that you wanted to ask as well so if you want to take the mic sure uh thank you Natalie um first uh Malik I uh I just wanted to express my uh my uh, admiration for your uh sleep deprivation superpower uh that uh I, I'll confess that uh, more than one deliverable in the course of my career has been achieved through lack of sleep. So I uh, I, I respect and admire the the fuel there. Um, the so I, I had a question kind of uh, related to um, the theme of, of, of race, um, you know, or, or space race specifically, and because um, that dynamic happens at a com at, at the enterprise commercial side as well, right? I mean. If we look at the early adopters, uh, you know, the early testers even of uh, quantum uh, computing, it's it's the same cast of characters in, uh, in you know investment banks and the pharmaceutical companies and, um, and and you know most of my career was on the investment banking side, a little bit of a past life, and they historically spend more on technology as a percent of revenue than any other industry, and so it's no surprise that they would be out there. But um, if, if you look at something like uh, the Gartner report, which most enterprises do track, like what, what organizations like Gartner and Forrester say, um, what one can you know, uh, talk about sort of the accuracy of, of their predictions, but they are used by, enter by enterprise IT buyers. Gartner last year had quantum computing at, at sort of the, the, the peak, I think they call it the peak of inflated expectations. So everybody, the way to interpret that is very, Kind of limited adoption potential in terms of the mainstream, and it's going to kind of go through a period of uh, disappointment, and then it'll plateau. That, and again, I'm I'm not a big buyer of of Gartner's model per se, but but a lot of companies are, um, you know. And I'm not sure who I would direct this question to, but I mean, kind of what what are your thoughts on just sort of the competitive dynamics, and is Gartner and some of the others that are sort of um, you know, kind of th throwing cold water on it for the enterprise. Personally, I think they're wrong, but uh, I, I I'd be curious what others think about that. 
I, I will I will start. Thank you, Eric, for your for your um, great question. And um, actually, I'm, I'm I'm going to reason based on the space economy, maybe. And there are two different economies that they are. They have each one has its uh, specific uh, uh, dynamic. Um, a part of what I do also in my research is is related to space economy and and the space ecosystem, and and it, when it started, uh, it started always um, like um, other similar let's say um, uh, and. Um, investment or funding intensive activity, uh, there's a lag to have a return and, uh, and investors need are aware about that. So the thing is like, uh, it's, it's um, uh, about the space economy and the space race that um, it started being uh, uh, a little independent in somehow of the governmental funding. And today what we are seeing, we see that uh, private investors are uh, um, uh, pouring heavily the money into, um, into uh, activities that are led by billionaires. And, uh, and, and if we see the, the dynamic, how it started and what it's going toward, Right now, it's changing, and there's paradigm shift in the space economy. Uh, but still, still, there's a problem which is called uh, uh, the the, um, uh, the the issue that we see today in in space is a bubble. Also, that it is there. You have a lots and lots of startups. You have money poured in in startups, and you have rounds, and you have the race of uh, uh, spacs, and 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 then what's what is going on? Also, what we call Darwinism in the space sector. So you. Have have Darwin is going around and you have startups are there then all in the sudden they are taken away by the uh, uh, let's say the natural selective uh, uh, or the 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 the, the, the nat nat natural selection that it is uh, uh, the, the, the issue that is going on in the space sector and when we go and see the the uh, nascent economy of of uh, like the quantum economy of course uh, now you see a lot of fundings they are uh, poured by uh, uh, by the, the the governments in order to um, to uh, get their their uh, initiatives uh, quantum initiatives uh, national initiatives kicking uh, and kicking off um, about investors in quantum uh, technologies you have some investors they are there they are pouring money also and you have big tech they are investing into that but about reports and what is the dynamic of the the the, the investments or the 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 the, the, the economy in of quantum it's not clear so i wouldn't i'm, I'm not familiar about this report exactly but i wouldn't uh, really uh, uh, rely upon, upon uh, reports because even the space economy, and this is, I, I wrote about it, there's a problem of uh, uh, valuation, there's a problem of input of data, there's a problem when they tell you the space economy is va valued of this uh, uh, much, four point something uh, billion uh, dollars, uh, uh, or whatever, it's not true because actually uh, based on, on, on uh, deep analysis and the situation going, there are uh, uh, double um, uh, double input of data between the different uh, uh, let's say uh, sectors or the, the upstream downstream and the midstream it's it's very very important to be careful careful and also with when they talk about ROI it's speculative it's still this is my opinion about the situation I don't know what you think Eric and I give uh, the mic to you back and I would like to hear uh, others to speak about it Malik, it's, it's really interesting. So uh, I appreciate that. I mean, what, what I took away from that is, is that a lot of the sort of observers that are in kind of embedded within uh, entrenched industries, say, for example, in, um, an IT analyst that is not an expert on quantum, but spends all day looking at usual computer systems and servers and databases and all of those kinds of things, probably don't have access, adequate access or appreciation for the signals. And there is there is a lot of volatility and, throth and froth in the early days of these you know, still emerging technologies. I think that's interesting. The, um, for folks here, I mean, I, I, you know, for, for those interested in tracking and or driving the commercial adoption of these technologies, things like the Gartner report are, and, and I'm happy if folks wanna reach out, I can 
I'll find the link and I don't have it handy, but I, I, I um, it, it's, it's paywall, but at least you'll know where to find it. Um, the, um, but uh, it's, it's, it's relevant because a lot of the folks who will be eventual adopters of these technologies, the, the, the leaders are already there. Goldman Sachs is already doing stuff with, you know, the, the, and, and they're very proud to put their, um, I don't mean specifically, but you know what I mean? Like the, the big names are already there doing stuff. It's the fast followers that are going to be kind of interesting, that are going to be less visible. And, and they watch those kinds of reports um, and to help guide what, uh, what they're going to do. So I, I appreciate the discussion. This has been a great conversation. So I appreciate it. I am, if the others have comment on it, I'm interested in other perspectives as well. Um, I mean, maybe I'll just um, come from the perspective of QKD in that um, as the sort of, you know, the, the earliest um, sort of quantum technology to, to you know, um, to come out of the starting gate, um, you know, I, I think we've experienced some of the, um, you know, things that now quantum computing are now going through. Um, so in, in terms of the hype curve, or, you know, if you believe it or not, um, you know, I, I think uh, we've, we're over the hump, <laughs> and, and now we're slowly trying to um, climb back up. Um, and, and I, I, you know, my, my fear is that you know that um, we'll, we'll see more um, you know peaks uh, of of the hype curve um, as as new entrants come in, and um, you know there are resurgence and in, in interest, um, and um, you know due to obviously you know the excite uh, excitement in terms of quantum computing and general um, you know buoying of of the whole of the whole area. Um, so you know I, I think. QKD has had to navigate a very delicate path in terms of, um, you know, giving an honest and, and level-headed uh, appraisal of the benefits of the technology, um, you know, you know, trying not to undersell the, you know, the, um, the technology uh, and, and trying not to really overpromise. And I, I think that this is something that, that we've been very conscious about of trying not to, um, you know, sell as a panacea. Um, because uh, you know nothing is insecurity is a very complex area, and any one thing can only be part of a of a, of a dedicated um, ecosystem of solutions. Um, so, you know, I, I think this is something that that you know maybe the rest of the industry you know really needs to um, learn and 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 take notice of 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 really giving the most balanced view of the technologies and um, you know not. Yeah, not falling for the hype, right? Um, I mean, there, are, I think there is, you know, very, very good reasons for for investing in technology and seeing, it, you know, the, the the great promise of it, and a lot of governments around the world have recognised that, and that's why they're investing, you know, quite large sums of money in the development of quantum technologies, quantum computing, and other things. Um, but um, you know, you know, I think people have to be realistic in terms of the timescales involved and of the, you know, the, the likely um, you know, benefits, because I think, I think the things that a lot of the benefits aren't going to be those that we immediately know about. Um, I think what I've um, seen through, you know, from, you know, being in the, in the, in the business, uh, you know, for more than 20 years, uh, what we thought were going to be the main applications actually um, are not maybe, you know, new things have come along that we didn't yet anticipate. Um, you know, when we started um, you know, developing quantum computers, um, new algorithms, new applications, new use cases, new ways of thinking about the advantages that quantum computers can bring. So, um, you know, I, I think it, it's good to to promote the, um, you know, the, the promise, but it has to be really tempered by um, expectation, realistic expectations to avoid the crash should, you know, the hype bubble burst. And Eric, what I, what I wanted to add to the discussion was, um, for me, in, in sort of in an industry context, it's, it is, you have to demonstrate business value. But, but it's not, um, the value is not about being able to do a calculation today that will, uh, that will revolutionize the industry because quantum computers, for instance, are nowhere near right now. So, so you have to then start to think about pathways to value. 
and what are, and then roadmaps to it all. And then the question is, do you believe that? So, so right now, for instance, when you have lots of quantum algorithms, you have many groups around the world developing lots of different ones, and they're all extremely intelligent people. But you know, if you're just staring at them, is this QAOA algorithm from this group better than this one? Is it just a decimal place difference? Or is it a revolutionary breakthrough? And then where is that then placed on a roadmap in terms of performance? But because quantum is so fundamentally different, you have to start early in order to start to get to grips with learning about the landscape, which is constantly evolving at a rapid pace as well. So it's, a, so it's tricky, but if the emphasis is on business value and then sharing that, being a bit more open from industry about where the value is actually at, uh, that would really help matters. Rupesh, the problem that, that it is uh, usually faced when investors look at, um, like, I'm not speaking about quantum only, but I'm speaking about, uh, like, in general, they look at, at uh, the, the technology, the use, the ROI, and, and uh, what you said, the values, most of the time is put at the end of the tick of the box, which is something that needs to be considered as we consider, the investor consider uh, let's say the, the the are these people that they are working on this kind of uh, uh, technology are able to deliver? Are they able to deliver? Are they able to deliver at the, at the uh, based on 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 the pitch they've done and everything? But uh, um, they don't look much at really what is uh, at stake when it comes to the business value, which is something we try to bring it to the, to the uh, arena, is like, what is the values that you're gonna bring into the technology that you are trying to build uh, in order to be considered? Because at the end of the day, that's also something to be value, evaluated. It's something that it needs to be back into the, or, or it, it needs to be in the picture before the investor uh, uh, choose. But, but again, the, the bubble is there and, uh, and the media is not, is not helping at all. And uh, a lot of people that are making uh, uh, also what, what, what I've seen and I hear uh, a lot of uh, companies that they are not, um, they don't have expertise into quantum at all who are making the input of data who are uh, uh, making these reports. And this is very important that the people in quantum, they bring uh, the, the people in business and, uh, and, and uh, um, you know, making this economic analysis, bring into the team working on these reports, uh, um, quantum technologies. And this is a job of uh, John Barnes to, uh, to propose to these, uh, you know, uh, uh, big companies that they are making all these reports to get people from our, um, you know, uh, our, our uh, uh, you know, your your network in order to help them on on that job. And funnily enough, I've got a, a few things happening behind the scenes, trying to educate some larger commercial entities. Let's say um, I can't say too much more than that, but. Um, that, that there are some sort of early stage conversations on that. Um, and, and actually, I'd like to just on that theme, I'd, I'd like to reference um, a question that I raised at an, an event recently. It was at the um, the, the City Quantum Summit um, at Mansion House. Um, Rupesh was one of the speakers there. Um, and one of the panels there was uh, Marco Pistoia, who is head of quantum at JP Morgan Chase. Um, and um, Clay, Kate Platanova, who is um, Group Chief Data, uh, Data Officer at HSBC. Um, and the question I asked related to whether the quantum winter was um, guaranteed to happen and we just need to mitigate against its effects, or whether it's something that, that could be avoided, and if so, do we put our efforts into avoiding that? Um, and it was interesting that whilst they both came from um, a, a sort of different areas of banking and technology within their background. Um, Marco felt that it didn't matter either way. <laughs> and, and Kate actually felt that it was something to be really concerned about and, um, and, and look to um, 
work out what the what they needed to do and whilst they didn't answer the, the question specifically it was it was interesting to see the difference in thought process around that so um again you know i, I don't think that there's that there's the answer there but there's an awful lot of different viewpoints and opinions and um I, you know it, we're, we're in for i think we're in for a um for, for a bumpy ride uh, or an exciting ride should i say one one way or the other um you know whether that's whether that's um, all, all sort of going going good and, and being fun, or whether there are some bumps on the road, um, and how how extreme they'll be, that's that's the um, I was going to say sixty four million dollar question, but it's probably worth a bit more than that, I think. And uh, just add to that, John, uh, is is a fundamental question: Do we actually want to see? A, a quantum sector and if we do which i certainly do then we need to do the things that will help to grow that ecosystem knowing you know knowing in in the ocean that, that there are sharks as well right there are people who are just not interested in the ecosystem and its growth they just want what they want so there has to be voices there has to be players there has to be agreements globally that will allow the sector to grow so that it does become a sector and it's a, you know, it's a, a sustainable sector at that. You know, so that's, that's a long road ahead of us. I, I would say one more thing. Actually, you said some uh, 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 sharks uh, over there. This is what scares me the most: is the the the, the takeovers, the acquisitions. When uh, uh, when 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 there is a little bit of uh, you know a, a peak of the smaller player in the quantum uh, um, ecosystem, they get acquired by the big sharks, not to help them, but to um, uh, to to just. Uh, let's say uh, kill um, any uh, like how I'm going to say it maybe competition they're not even competition to them but this is what what we are also witnessing in other sectors is when you have smaller players uh, um, uh, starting you know getting uh, um, um, their 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 way up what they do is they get acquired and uh, uh, this is a, a, a problem it's a, it's a, it's a anti competitive normally uh, behavior but it's let in a way or another because actually they get they acquire the smaller player in order to 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 keep the competition in their hands and this is what scares me in in the the quantum ecosystem We have one more question, but just before we do, Daniel, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I, I think, I think in, in the common computing industry, I mean, we're seeing what signs of of um, you know companies now joining together, right? So, uh, like Cambridge Quantum Computing now is joined with what Honeywell, um, um, you know, I, I, and. Yeah, you've got um, large. You've got large a mixture of large um, companies, established companies, as well as uh, startups. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure whether that that's a, a good or a bad sign in terms of it, is it a sign that the that the field is um, is the sector maturing that now there's a consolidation of of companies and expertise. But um, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in that area, but I, I, I'm certainly seen that. Um, you know, there is been developments in terms of how how um, you know, the company, the commercial side of things, is is developing, um, and it's going to be an interesting mix of how um, you know the hardware and the software side of things, how they interact and develop. Um, you know, obviously the the software um, to run on the computers has been um, you know a very uh, vigorous um, area of activity because I guess. Um, it's it's low, fairly low uh, capital investment. Um, apart from you know having to hire uh, very smart people to to work on the algorithms, uh, compared to hardware de development, which is traditionally you know very difficult and and really um, um, you know the domain of of you know you know uh, companies like Google or IBM or Microsoft. Um, so I mean, in terms of um, how the how the field is developing. 
Um, I'm, I mean, I'm fairly confident that, you know, that, that there are significantly enough big players together with a, with a, with a, you know, quite a healthy um, startup, um, um, you know, n- number of startups, uh, all working on, on, you know, a diverse uh, range of topics and areas that um, um, I, I think it's still, at least I, I'm optimistic that, that it's going to remain healthy, at least in the, in the near term. Thank you. So um, we just actually had another quick question coming in as well. So I'm going to pass over to to Bill if you had your question, and then um, John, have we got another time? Have we got time for one more question after Bill from Eric? Yeah, we're not we're not particularly militant. That's what I on, thought. On as long as people are okay to stay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, Bill, if if you're there, if you if you want to um, take the mic. Yeah. Sure. Hi. How. Thanks for joining. Uh, nice to see everyone again. Uh, yeah, so I, I, you know, I've been listening all along. I've got tons of comments on simply because I'm, I'm, I'm fairly involved in, in a lot of the different uh, areas in relation to quantum. You know, I had some, some comments for um, the gentleman who's pursuing a, a, a PhD degree. I'm, I'm in a very similar situation. Uh, my focus has been on computer vision um, uh, or quantum uh, computer vision. And that's specifically something that I chose because of my background in schooling. Um, you know, it, it is a wide area. Uh, there's lots of things to study, but I think that would be um, the, an important step is to just pick one thing that you really are interested in and focus on that. Um, th- that's highly important because you're not going to be able to do everything and, 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 and pursue all your, your different ideas, but uh, picking one at least will give you uh, the insight and keep you informed. Now, uh, our company does a lot of work for uh, the government sector, so these issues that deal with um, uh, ITAR and the international uh, trade and uh, uh, weapons uh, agreements that we have to deal with. Uh, I also do some work in, in cryptography for, for the Air Force here in the U.S. Um, and so they're very important things that are, that are involved in, in relation to that. I'm sure that there'll be a point where some of the work that either I do or people here in the States will do uh, that will actually get, uh, you know, some consideration from, from the U.S. government for, for different reasons. Um, you also notice that, you know, the U.S. also released um, a, a list recently of some Chinese, Japanese agencies that um, I think also uh, one in Singapore um, that, uh, you know, we have to be careful with in regards to what we uh, 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 communicate to them. Um, so that's also kind of an interesting piece uh, in relation to, you know, just the financial sector uh, where I'm seeing a lot of startup activity, honestly, is in the, uh, uh, the stack or the software development realm. Uh, a lot of these small startups can, of course, create their own hardware, like you've got, uh, you know, HP, IBM, um, uh, Honeywell, creating all these different uh, uh, technologies. But where there's a lot of uh, smaller players uh, that are coming up to light are in the software stack development, where they're trying to develop ways for programmers to actually uh, uh, implement their algorithms on uh, any type of backend system. Uh, and that's kind of hard because, of course, you have to uh, you know, you, that's a moving target, you know, as, as you know, we just saw from Stanford came out with a, a different method in photonics that might be able to use um, standard fiber optic tools and, and things like that. That's also kind of an interesting area, but uh, more or less, uh, a lot of the activity I'm seeing, at least in this realm is on the software engineering side is uh, as we prepare, uh, that is software developers prepare for uh, the quantum realm is, um, you know, what kind of systems are we going to be able to use and how can we uh, better um, the, uh, the applications and the algorithms that we're currently using uh, in AI, you know, which is also a big area, and, and implement them onto uh, various uh, quantum hardware. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the, the, the idea of it. Now, on the financial side, of course, you know, I don't know if a lot of you know IonQ. I bought in at $9. You know, it's at about $25 right now. That's kind of a shameless thing to say, but you'll see some of these uh, entities that are going to come in and basically just eat up some of these smaller players in there for the very reasons as Ms. Loeb mentioned, is that they'll basically kill the competition just so that they can stay ahead. Um, you know, the, uh, on the last aspect, education-wise, I'm part of Q World. Um, uh, my local university here in San Antonio, Texas, doesn't offer any classes on quantum computing. The nearest one is Austin, Texas, of course, you may be familiar with. So I'm, I had to revert to take courses online that are offered, you know, out of Riga, Latvia. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of interesting to see all the different people that are there, you know, from India, from Pakistan, from 
um, uh, countries in the African uh, uh, continent, you know, all joining in and trying to learn um, because they know that there might be something here that they can take advantage of. And I, and I think that's a great thing. And that's, that to me is, is something saying global um, and, and I hope it continues. And, and that's all I have, but thank you very much, everyone. That's that's great, Bill. Um, we're not con connected on LinkedIn. Um, I will I will send you um, um, a request because actually I think there is a synergy about what we are doing. Thank you. Okay, so if, if there's no one that's got any um, additional comments, then Eric, did you want to um, ask your question? Yeah, uh, thanks, Natalie. Actually, this was more just uh, a, a, a remark and uh, going back to the some of the concerns raised about um, quantum winter, which I hadn't heard that, I have to confess, I hadn't heard that expression, uh, so I Googled it. Um, the, um, I, I would, I, I guess what I would say is, and, you know, I, I come from a background of enterprise IT, both most of that on the adoption side, you know, on the, on the actual enterprise, uh, some of it on the service provider side. Um, and I, I would just say, uh, you know, to take heart. Um, I'm old enough to remember when, when everybody was saying AI is never going to happen. And of course, we still don't have general AI, but AI is driving massive amounts of spend and technology disruption in in organizations all over the place. Um, and so, so the way things emerge isn't always the way that we think it's going to. Um, and so, and the, 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 you know, a, a, a kind of a pause or, 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 or change in the trajectory of a technology's evolution, it happens for, for everything has gone through that um, or virtually everything. So, um, uh, I, I would, you know, I would just say, uh, you know, keep pressing on um, the, because uh, I, I think that the, you know, insert here all of the, you know, potentials of, of the technology and, and its benefits. So um, that's all I would say is I, I think there's a lot of uh, very uh, encouraging lessons to be learned in, in, uh, in the technologies that, that, have, that have come before this in terms of their eventual adoption and uh, the impact that they make. That's all. Yeah, thank you for that, Eric. And was, was there anyone else that wanted to um, pass comments or add to that? Then, um, otherwise, I mean, it's been it's been quite a mammoth session today. So, um, thank, thanks for everyone that's um, that's still with us. Um, there's an awful lot now to, to digest and think about and, and, and I think get all, for all of us to, to get our heads around. Um, but that's exactly what um, an entangled discussion should do when we've got multiple guests with different vantage points um, and, and also audit the audience bringing um, such stimulus to the discussion as well. So um, I'd, I'd like to obviously thank um, all of our audience today. So Sonali, who's, who's had to um, drop off, um, Malak, Rupesh and Dan. Daniel, I'd um, like to thank Natalie for um, the assistance today and all of the great questions um, and observations from Bill, Eric, Avanash and, and everyone else that can attend. Um, and so moving into December, we, we're changing things up a little bit with um, uh, an end of year celebration where um, the guests from the series of this year will come back and, and form um, different panels and the, the themes will be sort of looking back on um, the things that have happened this year and, and what people are looking forward to next year. Um, so, um, slight, as I say, slightly different um, structure to that, but it should be really informative and a lot of fun. So, um, once again, thanks everyone for, uh, for being here today um, and we'll see you shortly. <laughs>